Welcome to the podcast, Gal. Thanks a lot. Okay, so let's kick it off by giving the listeners a little bit of background about yourself. I know you've been doing Pagaya now for a while, but why don't you hit, you hit on some of the, the highlights of your career to date? Sure. Um, and again, Peter, thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's been it's been a pleasure. So a little bit of background about myself. I was born and raised in Israel. Um, all my adulthood, I was living abroad, Switzerland, London, um, and in the US. Studied economics and statistics. Was falling in love with the financial world very much out of the gate. I was working as a banker in UBS and Deutsche Bank um, on structured products um, and specifically on, on CLOs in different, different parts. And somewhere around 2016, started to flirt with the idea of how technology could be injected into these very unique markets and could create a disruption and formed together with my other two co-founders, Avital Pardo, which is the CTO, and Yav Yulzari, which is the CRO, um, Pagaya in 2016. Fast forward 2018, I moved to the States because it was very clear that New York is the capital of the capital of the world. Right. Um, and therefore, understood that in between these um, amazing buildings, the right people that make the right decisions are sitting and I should be part of them. And fast forward thereafter, um, build the company to be hundreds of millions of dollars of revenues um, with the premise we have today um, and to keep public just over a year ago um, and build it to the Pagaya we know today together with an amazing executive team and the co-founders. Right. So what was, can, let's just go back to 2016 for a, for a minute. What was the thing that you saw? Was it, I mean, consumer credit was, um, was starting to get disrupted. We had a lot of the online lenders that were getting some serious traction. Um, is it, was that, was there something that they were doing that you saw as an opportunity or what was the specific opportunity? So let, let me, or allow me to take even one or half a step before. Okay. Is before even we got to the consumer credit, I think I think the premise was big data, AI, which are buzzwords today, but back then were tools to assess risk, um, sophisticated ones, the advanced one, but really the ability to do that. How can they disrupt and help um, the big capital markets of the world and people in general? When we started to dig into that, it was very clear that one of the areas that has the utmost amount of data and has the ability to make big changes rather quickly was the consumer credit, as you mentioned, with the merge of um, the fintech lenders per se, um, Renault from Lending Club back then, Aaron from Prosper and so on and so forth. And, 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 the, and the idea that we can help these different lenders to be able to say yes to more consumers or in the way we put it in our mission to provide access to credit more often to people was really the premise behind everything and the idea that AI and the right connectivity could, could make it happen. And maybe a last point to that, it was very obvious to us that the work of a lender or the fintech lenders as such did such a great job, call it fintech lending 1.0, that we as another competitive or competitor, not going to bring a real value to the world. So we went to the backseat of the B2B2C model and as an enabler of at the beginning fintech lenders today, just every lender or a bank out there. Right, right. So maybe you could just talk about today then how how you're actually partnering. I mean, are you? I mean, you talked about like you know some they, these these online lenders or fintech lenders. You know, they would they had a specific credit box, and often you know, many people would come in and they'd have to turn them down. And I know that that's how you started, right? You started with working with those turndowns, but how are you how are you partnering today with 
with both fintech lenders and traditional lenders. So let's go back for a second for for the the, the problem set, which is although fintech got progress a lot and and the financial system has progressed a lot in the United States in the last four decades. Still, there is something like 42% of people that are getting rejected, declined, whatever you want to call them, in the moment when they are applying for, for, for a credit. Now, think about it from two aspects of that. One is the efficiency part of it, which is they already came to the place, they already look for the credit, and still there is this um, decline. And think about it from the other aspect of the emotional piece of the person who is going through that mm-hmm. and now needs to look for a different solution and has and, and is experiencing a bad day because of the because of the no that he got. So so when we thought about that and the way we partner with with the different partners to your question, is we are connecting via technology into these partners. We are embedding our AI and capabilities into the loan origination systems of these different partners. And we are allowing to increase the approval of different borrowers, which they, for some reason, has decided to decline. This is so meaningful that we're coming to a 20% lift in the most in the, in the good cases of better approvals, more funding. And for the lenders, the most interesting part is while this consumer is becoming their consumer and recognizing their brand, we are still coming back with the ability to fund it and to take it off their balance sheet. Right, right. Yeah, that's a really critical piece, right? Because you, so you work with both sides of the of the equation here, where you've got the lenders and then you've got the the investors on the other side. So maybe, what what types of investors are, are you working with? So, so the investor side. If you think about it, when we are speaking about it, and it's a two-sided lending network or AI lending network, we have the the, the most known institutional investors in the world. Um, GAC is the most well-known one. Um, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Singapore that is working very closely with us. Um, Varde, Angela Gordon are all names that were publicly out there that are working with Pagaya and using our technology and capabilities to get access to these to these assets. And on the other side, the, the the lenders, which part of them is the fintech you discussed about, but they are more traditional players like Westlake, for example, is the late, latest announcement that we have, which is now routing to our systems, into our um, capabilities, um, consumers from their full dealership networks. Another one that you're very familiar with is LI Bank, mm-hmm. which is the biggest subprime lender Um bank in the US and ov- obviously we're looking to sign up um, more and more. But but the bottom line is um, in between auto loans, in between consumer credit and up until POS, which our most not- known pl- partner there is Klarna, we have a very well diversified partners into our network that are using day to day while we speak fully automated 24 seven, the systems and the solutions of Pagaya to be able to provide more access to more people more often. Okay, so I want to dig into your underwriting just for a minute, if we could. Um, how does it how does it work? Are you are you using data beyond like credit bureau data, or you're really focusing just on on the same data that that other lenders are, are looking? So as you can imagine, um, working in the U.S. and being heavily regulated um, financial service, we are very much bounded to the FCRA compliant data. And therefore, most of it is the credit bureau as such and the proprietary data that we have. I would say that the one layer that we have very strongly that 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 is helping us in these capabilities of the underwriting is the data that is being created from the different lenders that we are working with. So while a mono lender has its own data set, when we are sitting in the middle and having this unique point of view of the different flow and the different changes that all the lenders are doing, it's informing us, it's helping us, it's helping the models to be more accurate into the ability 
to assess risk and to be able to price it well. And, and a lot of times, like we are getting the question of like, why why should should the banks or, or the lenders collaborate with you and provide you the data? And, and the truth of the matter is, is as long as we get more data and the data sets is more robust, we can by definition approve more consumers. Mm-hmm. So the interest rate are so much, the, the interest rate, the interests are so much aligned in that in that respect that we are at this point with our partners working very collaboratively to be able to provide the most robust data sets to our models to be able to approve the highest amount of consumers out of the gate okay okay so then are you and i presume you know one of the great things about ai is that the models get better over time can you sort of tell us how your models have evolved um since since your first your first go round Yes, definitely. So, so the very basic evolution I would speak about it is the movement from um, the very straightforward person alone into different markets. So the shifts and the ability to inject into our models information from personal loan space, auto loans, and up until the POS and the point of sale. So a very strong, robust um, kind of like view of the consumer from different type of angles that usually a specific lender is looking on it only from the angle they are looking to provide the credit. The second piece is there is a level of granularity of data that you are being able to conclude and to capture when you're working with different lenders or different channels. And that is allowing you to think about it as a box that is every time getting a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And the outskirts of it are the ones you're making and becoming more a mainstream. So, so, Think about the evolution of the models of being able to capture different type of flows, different type of borrowers, expanding into different type of FICOs, et cetera, to be able to inform really the definition of risk and therefore to be able to price the reward. Um, another anecdote that I can give is that people are less talking about, but when you're setting up an interest rate, Beside the very competitive part that there is for the market and the, the so-called adverse selection or the positive selection that one could get, there is actually an outcome of like the, the, the pricing that you are determining into the ability of different borrowers um, to actually stand within the payment. So if you will price that as a 12% or a 14 or a 16, that, that will translate it into a different monthly payment for that borrower and therefore will impact the probability of default of that borrower to pay. So I think within time, what, what, what we folks in Pagaya have learned and the research department did an amazing job in that is to think about the pricing, dynamic pricing in part um, as a factor that should be included into the ability to provide applications, really what is the thing that will be most helpful for them um, from a lending perspective. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So. To, I just want to be clear on something for a minute. It, it, are you always bringing the two sides of the marketplace, bringing your 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 lending technology and the investors, or do you also work? Because I mean, some people might want to keep this on balance sheet, right? They don't. They want to. They want to add more, add more um, borrowers. They want to sort of um, monetize their declines or help approve more, which you which your which your software can do. But they might want to keep it on balance sheet. So, do you work? Do you work in two ways where you will just provide the technology and not the balance sheet, or do you always work with uh, with both sides? So as for now, our business model is really tied with one each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so production is the investment and, and therefore the underwriting is correlated to such. But in the future, we are thinking about opening that and provide it as a service for different type of population or for different type of partners that are looking, as you say, um, to get the, the 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 beauty about the underwriting capabilities, but in the same time to keep the assets on their balance sheets. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So I want to talk about um, the ABS markets. You, you, you've said you talked about your background in structured credit. Um, I was just reading your earnings report from Q2 and you, you, you said there that you were the number one personal loan ABS issuer. So is that, I mean, and that that's a, it's obviously a really, you're obviously putting a lot of deals through large deals. Is investor demand still staying strong for this asset class? 
Yeah, so so that's a great question. Um, and again, just 30,000 foot um, paid, which is the shelf that is actually representing the personal loan, ABS issuance, um, is the dominant shelf in the US and today for many investors. If you want to get exposure to consumer credit, you actually choosing Pagaya um, by definition because we are one of the largest, the most liquid um, and the most well known out there. Um, I would say that investor demand is 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 actually getting stronger and stronger. The weakest point I will I will highlight it as the end of Q4 2022. And from there throughout 2023, we see more and more demand coming through um, as a lot of talks about the economy better getting to a better place and 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 the understanding that the consumer is standing strong and being able to push the economy as such. And the, the backdrop of kind of like lower performances of vintages that tripled in in the heights of 21 and the start of 2022 is actually fading away. We see many more players are coming into the into the into the, the ecosystem and our our transactions are usually oversubscribed um, one after the other in the market. So that's, I think, the biggest sign for, right. for your question of the demand for our so-called paper. Right. Well, let's let, let's talk about the economy for a minute because you, you know, you've got a unique view, particularly on the sort of the the non-prime consumer, you, you you can, and these are the, the there's a lot of uh, talk about, you know, student loan repayments are starting back up again and the consumer, how long can the consumer hold up? I mean, are you seeing any signs right now that um, the consumer is having problems, you know, paying back their, their loans? So if I need to summarize the two biggest phenomena that we see, we see a rather strong stability on the consumer's payment um, and the ability to pay definitely from anything that was originated in the last year um, or so. So I would say that from the terminiation of the ability of consumers to pay is actually, we don't see any signs for that as such. Um, I think you could assume that for now, and again, things are changing every day, but that the inflation wave that was very noticeable in the 21 and 22 is kind of like behind us from a consumer perspective and things have rather stabled um, from that perspective. Let's see what's going to happen with the oil prices in, in the next few quarters. But like for now, that's definitely the statement that we are seeing in our insights of our AI network. On the other side of it, credit availability is in the highest decline Um Definitely the longest period we have seen of decline in credit availability. So the, the 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 what the Fed does from an interest rate perspective is definitely impacting the ability of different borrowers to um, have access to credit, and and we see that consistently from Q3 last year um, and getting stronger and stronger headwinds um, as 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 the day goes by. So, so a lot of like lack of availability of credit for for different people and different borrowers, which is I think is the main theme. And a lot of it is a combination of two. One is the Fed that I already mentioned, and the other one is the so-called banking crisis that we are experiencing, or the lack of liquidity in the mid-sized banks, which are by definition the strongest force for providing these type of um, loans and liquidity to the market from a consumer credit aspects. So these are the two major things we're seeing out there. So is that lack of credit availability a good thing for Pagaya because you 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 work on expanding credit availability um or or is this or are you being negatively impacted overall? So so yes, you you're absolutely correct. This is a positive thing for Pagaya. Um the fact that there are less credit available out there, we are filling the gaps. Uh, we just announced today that we partner up with Varde, which is one of the biggest asset managers in the world and one of our investors to provide $100 million plus capital for one of the credit unions out there. Um, so it's giving us a um, push for our business model and some kind of a catalyst for our existence. Um, and in the same time, I will mention that um, this is more a semantic thing 
to stay. So like if if we spoke about 08, which was the big thing for pushing big banks to become more conservative, it definitely feel that the last events that happened in 2023, and particularly SVB, have had a shift in the thinking um, of the mid-size uh, super regional banks and credit unions on the ability to be competitive and in the ability to be aggressive from a pricing perspective as such. And I think it would be very interesting to see um, fintech going forward, which adjusting a little bit more to capital markets, asset management money, rather than um, depository capital capital as such. And, and Pagaya, as a player that has a very strong footing on these sides, um, is definitely benefiting from that. And you can see that over the quarterly earning that you have mentioned, that usually lending businesses in these environments are shrinking by 20, 30%, and Pagaya is actually growing and continuing to grow. So the proof is in the pudding for, to some right. extent. So what about the, the interest rate increases that we've seen? Um, you know, how, like, how is that? I mean, I'm just curious about the pricing of, of loans obviously has gone up. Um, you know, we've, we were at, we're at now over 5%, uh, you know, Fed funds rate. And, you know, we're, two years ago, we were close to, you know, we're at 0 0.25. So that is not all being passed on, right? Is that is that sort of one of the things that's really stopping the availability? I mean, what what's the impact been of these rising interest rates? Yeah, so it's exactly what you said. I, I can give you even something more interesting to to think about from, from a consumer perspective perspective and pattern and where they when it where it, where it meets the, the the actual consumer. I would say there are two major population that feeling the impact most and for most. On the little bit more subprime lower FICO people that usually would have been under the federal cap of 30 or 36 percent APR um call it a year ago and now 5% higher, let's assume just one-to-one -one increase has happened. Um, now they are above this cap, just all else be equal. And therefore they are out from the mainstream ability to borrow um, from a regular lender. So so I would say that, that is definitely impacting the, 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 the a little bit um, softer population that would have any way hard time accessing to credit and many of them are being pushed out from the system and this is very negative outcome um, sometimes necessary to tem to tame the inflation but definitely has a negative impact on millions of lives of people in the US and and the other side of the equation is a little bit on the demand side think about the super prime bowels that like you remember a lot of that um uh, advertisement of like you can buy a car with 36 payments and then 2.99 percent APR or sometimes even um, even lower than that. That word doesn't exist anymore. So if you think about the five percent as a floor plus take a little bit of the spread, like eight percent became a floor even for the most super prime type of bowels, and therefore many of them are deciding just to use their own good saving or cash rather than to borrow. Um, it's something that, that for them is a high interest rate. The, the middle population will experience just a little bit more expensive, expensive credit and less availability. But like the 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 more subprime population will be game out from from that thing, which is a negative thing, and the super prime will most probably reduce their demand for credit as such. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I'm 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 curious about that top end, the people that are sort of you know, they're pricing out. I mean, because what you're, a lot of what you do, right, is, you know, I, you know, you, you sort of isolate the, those people that have been mispriced by the um, you know, traditional credit bureaus and or traditional credit, uh, you know, the people that use just, um, you know, the, the bureau scores and that sort of thing. So are there, are you able to sort of um, help like temper that all those numbers of people. I'm just curious when you get up to that 36% um, and you say some people are just pricing, pricing out, are you able to kind of come in then and help ex like, like reduce the number of people that are pricing out? Yes. So that's exactly how um, we are helping. We are helping the different consumers and the population. Um, 
and and the ability to find people that would be rejected and would not kind of like stand within this threshold of the 36 and we actually know this is a very good 18 percent loan or 16 um so so there is a lot of that that is happening more today um because the pool of people that are left outside is bigger so it's it's exactly playing to the premise of pagaya and to the to the reason why we exist and how we think about the world and what we are working with our models in our ai network to be able to provide mm -hmm. okay um you know, this, the last 12 months, I mean, you've been doing AI for, um, you know, from the beginning and the last 12 months has seen an explosion in AI uh, discussions. I mean, we saw the, all the, the big CEOs in Washington the other day um, talking with uh, the senators. I'm curious about all the attention that AI is getting. Has that, has that been helpful for Pagai or is that really a distraction? So for, I I actually love it. I think there is something about the human nature that doesn't have really the ability to assess value until it's not being easily digestible. And what I think OpenAI did, and it's specifically that company with mm -hmm. a chat GDP, it made it easy for people to understand how much value there is in AI. If you will go back to the financial industry or the fintechs or many other type of industries, the existence of AI and the actual value and implementation of that actually happened in between 10 years ago to three years ago. Now, obviously there is much more to do and many more places to, to be impacted by that. But like, a lot of things that you know, like the Google search engine, um, especially on, on, on the different parts of it, is built on big data and AI. But the ability to make it so popular, so easy to understand, was really brought to the world by OpenAI and ChatGDP. Mm -hmm. Now, what that is creating is creating a very different perception of people into the, what the value it can bring. So think about the chief credit officer that is sitting in a big bank that now his managers and the compliance people and the regulators and everyone is speaking about that. It's easier for him to come and to say, you know, that's actually could bring value to our premise too. So maybe let's talk with the guy and be able to try to see how we can leverage that. So the, the ability to bring it easy to you at your home, as you call it, and the ability to understand what it means is helping people to bring it to the mainstream. And for that, I think the world in general owe a big thank for, for, for Chat GDP. And by the way, funny enough, in one of the one of our earning calls, I don't know if you noticed, I think two earning calls ago, we we got Chat GDP, we gave him all the inputs of all our historical earning calls and, and scripts. And we asked him to play a role of an analyst mm -hmm. and to ask a question of what is the most interesting question that they could ask and answer it as it was God. Check it out in one of our scripts. You will be amazed. Right. Um, right. No, I, I remember reading about that. That was, that was really interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll try, I'll make sure I link to that in the show notes because I think it is really worth uh, worthwhile checking out. Okay. Uh, just a couple more questions here. I want to talk about being a public company because you, know, you, you ha it hasn't been an easy time for really any fintech company uh, in the public markets recently, but I don't really want to talk about stock price. I want to talk about how being a public company has has changed Pagaya. I think it's creating a very positive feedback loop. Think about working with a mirror in your face every day. So no more excuses. No more um, being able to hide the things you're weak at. And it's actually driving to a much quicker, better outcome for your ability to execute. You need to be careful on that because overhearing what people are saying over two short periods is not helpful. But always remembering that you have a goal to work, um, a mission to work, ability to distribute that, I think it's a very rewarding and I definitely, with all the challenges, will will advocate for, for any founders 
um, or CEOs when they think the company is ready to jump to the water and to do that because that's the best way to create an excellent organization. I definitely think Pagaya is one of them. Okay, so last question. I know you can't make any forward-looking statements about um, Pagaya, but I'm interested in what you look, when you look at 2024, I'm interested in how you see the, the macro environment and the, the impact on the, uh, the consumer lending space and whether you think we're still going to be uh, in, in a strong environment next year. So if I need to guess, and this is only a guess, um, I would say that the experiment that all of us were part of, which is providing money for the people as part of COVID, um, and therefore after finding unique ways to take the money back to the governments in the form of higher interest rate, has created a lot of uncertainty. Usually businesses and people are not good with a high uncertainty. So I do think that as we go into the future and 2024 being, being the next step of it, we're going to have more certainty on the understanding of these impacts and therefore will create more stability that in return will turn out to be more pragmatic and positive here. So actually I'm optimistic about the future. Um, and I think that all of what we are experiencing right now is just an outcome of a very big experiment that all of us happened to be um, part of and, and that the other outcome of that could be much worse. Um, so, so I think that if we go more and more into the future, things will come back to what we used to know before. Um, and hopefully that that's going to be positive for all of us and for the consumers to be able to continue to provide that as such. Okay. Yes. Well, I, I hope so as well. Gal, really appreciate you coming on the show today. Thanks. Thanks so much. It was a really interesting conversation. Thanks a lot, Peter. Appreciate you having me. Okay. See you.